This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and today is Friday, and that means it's time for my 498th edition of MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. We're only a week away from the 500th episode of this series, which is pretty amazing. That many episodes would never have happened if it weren't for the support of all of you watching this video right now, so thank you. In today's video, we're going to take a look at lands that produce multiple mana. Lands are, of course, crucial in Magic because they allow you to cast most spells. Most of them only produce a single mana, so when you get one that can produce more than that, you're getting a pretty massive upgrade. On the whole, lands that produce multiple mana have been quite powerful throughout the game's history, and this list is quite impressive. The top six cards all have more than 100 points, and the top three have over 200. To be eligible for this video, a land had to be able to produce more than one mana. I did exclude filter lands from this list as they don't actually net you mana. While the land does produce two mana, to make that you have to pay one mana. In most situations, you're still tapping two lands for two mana, so I didn't think they belonged here. In this video, we'll take a look at the 10 lands that produce multiple mana that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I score cards in these videos. A first tier top eight is worth two points. This includes events like Pro Tours and Mythic Championships. And a second tier top eight is worth one point. This includes events like Grand Prix and Magic Fests. At number 10, it is Lotus Field, which is the newest card to make this list. Lotus Field, like Black Lotus, which it references, can produce three mana of any one color, and it has hexproof. Of course, it also comes with the downside that you have to sacrifice two lands when it enters the battlefield, and it also enters the battlefield tapped. The good news is you can respond to that trigger by tapping those lands for mana first. Lotus Field has been a powerhouse in Pioneer and has been a headliner in a tier 1 deck in that format ever since the format was created in 2019. It is played in decks that untap the land over and over again while ripping through the deck with cards like Pour Over the Pages and Vizier of Tumbling Sands. The earliest version of this deck used Underworld Breach and Thassa's Oracle to just keep casting things over and over again, untapping the lands, and ripping through the library until you could win with the Oracle Trigger. Underworld Breach did eventually get banned in Pioneer, but Lotus Field survived this banning by adapting. The plan was still to untap it a bunch, but now you could also copy Lotus Field with Thespian Stage, allowing for even more crazy mana. This version of the deck looks to power into Omniscience and then win the game with Approach of the Second Sun. In addition to all of that Pioneer success, Lotus Field has also gained a single point in Modern. Lotus Field decks look likely to continue to find success in Pioneer going forward, and it has some potential in the new Explorer format as well. At number 9, I have Boros Garrison. The Garrison is part of a cycle of 10 lands from the original Ravnica block, all of which can tap for two colors associated with each guild. The downside is they all enter the battlefield tapped and make you return a land in play to your hand. Of the 10, only Boros Garrison had enough points to make the list, with the Simic land just missing out. You might be thinking this is the same sort of thing as a filter land, but it ultimately isn't because this is a single land that can produce two mana. Once you have a second land in play, you have three mana total, unlike with filter lands where you have two mana with two lands in play. While the land found some success in both block and standard, Boros Garrison and the other Ravnica bounce lands are the most famous for being played in Amulet Titan decks in Modern. Amulet of Vigor can untap any permanent that enters the battlefield tapped, and this means you can use the mana from the Garrison right away. The original Amulet Titan deck also used Summer Bloom, which allowed you to turn the downside of having to bounce a land into upside, because you could just play the same bounce land over and over again and tap it for two mana every time. This allowed for primeval titans very early in the game who would search up even more lands. The garrison appears in virtually every primeval titan deck in modern because using the titan trigger to search for it and sun home fortress of the legion was a pretty formidable combo to end the game. Summer Bloom eventually got banned but the titan deck has survived and is still a major force in modern. If you're looking for a deeper dive on that deck check out my deck history video on the topic. Boros Garrison is also the most commonly played bounce land in Popper, and that's what allows it to outperform some of the other bounce lands that appear in modern Primeval Titan decks. It is likely to continue to gain points going forward, and some of the other bounce lands, as I noted, are only a few points behind Lotus Field, so they could share a slot with the Garrison in the near future. 
At number eight, I have Gaia's Cradle. This powerful and expensive land gives you one green mana for each creature you control every time you tap it. That can result in some absurd mana, with the only downside being that it produces zero mana when you have zero creatures in play, unlike most lands. But the upside is worth that downside, as it very rarely becomes incapable of making mana. It got banned out of Urza's block constructed because not only was it capable of producing absurd amounts of mana, it was also very easy to tutor up with crop rotation. It powered mono green aggro decks in both block and standard. The land has been plenty powerful for the Eternal formats too, appearing the most often in Elves and Legacy and Bizarre Aggro in Vintage. It's going to keep gaining points in those Eternal formats. At number 7, it is Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx. Nykthos can tap for a single colorless mana, but you can also pay 2 and tap it to add mana equal to your devotion of a particular color. The decks Nykthos is played in are obviously built to take advantage of it, so they have lots of colored mana symbols on their permanents, and Nykthos can generate insane amounts of mana. Devotion was one of the format-defining mechanics for Theros Standard, with many Devotion decks achieving Tier 1 status, and Nykthos played a very large role in that. While it saw play in a variety of Devotion decks, its most frequent homes were in Devotion to Blue, Devotion to Black, and Devotion to Green. In Devotion to Blue, it could help you easily cast Cyclonic Rift with Overload, and in Devotion to Green, you could cast a huge Genesis Hydra. Nykthos also has a few points in Modern where it's appeared in Elf decks, who generally plan on using Nykthos to pump huge amounts of mana into Azuri Renegade Leader and win the game. It's also been pretty successful in Mono Green Devotion decks in Pioneer, and it's going to keep gaining points in the future. At number 6, I have Eldrazi Temple. This land can be tapped for only a single colorless mana, but it can produce two mana at a time if you're interested in casting Eldrazi spells or activating their abilities. It actually took quite a while before Eldrazi Temple really became an important magic card. It was printed in 2010, and for the first five years of its existence, it only mustered two points. Eldrazi were just too expensive for the formats it was legal in, even with the Temple and Eye of Ugin around. By the way, if you're wondering why the Eye isn't on this list, it's because it doesn't technically tap for its mana, it just reduces the cost of Eldrazi spells by two. Anyway, it would only be the release of Battle for Zendikar block five years later that would lead to the temple becoming one of the best lands in all of Magic. That said, introduced some cheaper, more aggressive Eldrazi, and this led to decks in Modern Legacy and Vintage that used the Eye and Eldrazi Temple to have absolutely ridiculous starts to games that allowed them to run people over. The Eye did eventually get banned in Modern, and that led to a bit of a setback for the Temple, but it eventually transitioned into Eldrazi Tron decks in the format, which used the Temple alongside some other lands that can tap for multiple mana to power out some of the bigger Eldrazi. If you want to learn more about Eldrazi decks, check out my deck history that covers them. The Temple is going to keep gaining points going forward, especially in Modern alongside the Tron lands, and that's a pretty good transition because... At number 5, we have those very same Tron lands. They get their name because their full power is only unlocked when they're all used together. They only tap for a single mana normally, but they can produce a combined 7 mana on turn 3 if you manage to have one of each in play. That's some impressive ramp, so it's no surprise that Tron lands have spawn decks built around them in Standard, Extended, Modern, and Popper. These decks seek to tutor up the various Tron lands or draw them as quickly as possible. Modern is the format where the Tron deck has had the most sustained success, as it's been a relevant deck in the format since the format was created in 2011. Modern Tron's scariest turn 3 play is Karn Liberated, a super powerful planeswalker that is challenging to beat at any stage of the game, but that's especially true on turn 3. You can bet that these three lands will keep on producing 7 mana on turn 3 in Modern going forward. Tron decks are also another deck that's been covered in my deck history series. At number 4, it is Tolarian Academy. It's part of the same super powerful cycle as our number 8 card, Gaia's Cradle. It can tap and produce a blue mana for every single artifact you control. It ultimately proved to be even more busted than Gaia's Cradle, partly because Urza's block had a plethora of strong artifacts. It was so good in block, standard, and extended that it was banned in all of those formats, and it was also banned in Legacy before it was even given a chance there. Even the game's most powerful format, Vintage, can't allow players the ability to play more than one copy of the Academy, so it's restricted there. It managed to amass its massive score despite all those banned bannings and restrictions, though, because a single copy of it appears in a whole lot of decks in Vintage, as there are several artifact-based decks in the format, including Mud and Shops. Like a lot of the cards on this list, decks that could find ways to untap the Academy were particularly broken. In Extended, this was most famously accomplished with Mind Over Matter. The Academy, Mind 
over Matter Deck was only allowed to exist for a single event before the ban hammer came down. Academy is going to keep being a fixture in vintage going forward. At number three, it is Mishra's Workshop, the second consecutive land that loves artifacts. The Workshop can tap to produce three mana, but you can only use that mana to cast artifact spells. But yeah, there's not any real setup here. Just jam your deck full of artifacts, and on turn one, you can generate three mana with this thing, which is crazy. This card's power was quickly recognized, and it ended up getting restricted before the first major sanctioned tournament ever happened, which was Worlds in 1994. This ultimately led to it never seeing any play in Standard or Extended. It also ended up getting banned in Legacy when that format was created. And as a result, the Workshop has only ever gained points in Magic's most powerful format, Vintage, the only format where decks can keep up with this type of fast mana. It's been a format-defining card in Vintage since the format began receiving more regular sanctioned events in 2005. I mentioned Vintage Shops decks when I discussed Academy, and this is where that deck gets its name. Shops decks seek to produce a ton of mana and play out several artifact creatures that will kill the opponent in only a few turns. Before Shops decks became a thing, it was played in more prison-oriented artifact decks like Stacks. You can pretty much expect Mitra's Workshop to show up in the top eight of just about any Vintage event, so it's going to keep gaining points, but it has a ways to go if it's going to catch the top two cards on this list like the number two, City of Traitors. This is a land that can tap to produce two colorless mana. There's a downside, and that is that if you play a land, you have to sacrifice City of Traitors. But the huge mana boost is worth the downside, as evidenced by the 299 points City of Traitors has amassed across multiple formats over the years. Legacy has been its most successful format by far. It sees play there in a wide variety of decks in the format, especially in decks that look to take advantage of one huge turn to win the game, like combo decks and reanimator. This gets you to your game-winning turn a full turn earlier, and the downside doesn't matter much, since the turn it gives you will often determine the outcome of the game. City of Traders is going to keep on seeing a ton of play in Legacy, but it probably won't ever catch the number one card on this list, which is Ancient Tomb. Like City of Traders, it can tap for two colorless mana. In this case, the downside is that it does two damage to you. That downside is preferable to the downside of City of Traders and decks that actually look to win the game over a few turns since they would like to keep playing lands and adding to the board. So the Tomb often sees play in the same decks as City of Traders, plus a lot of creature-based decks in Legacy like Goblins Eldrazi and Dragon Stompy. It's also seeing much wider play in Vintage, where it frequently shows up alongside Mishra's Workshop. It's going to keep on gaining points, and it doesn't seem very likely it will ever relinquish its number one slot on this list. So, those are the 10 lands that produce multiple mana that have been the most successful at Magic's highest level of competition. If you're interested in producing more mana with your lands, check out the description, where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in this video. If you want to make sure you catch future episodes of this series and a whole lot of other Magic content, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on the almost 500 other MTG Top 10s, including many more that look at lands, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.